Welcome back to Good Law, Bad Law. On today's episode, my guest is Leslie Jose Ziegel. He is a partner at Greenspoon Martyr Law Firm in Miami, but he is also the general counsel, or as he likes to say, the conciliary to the musical recording artist Pitbull. And we're talking with Leslie about his fascinating career, first in the music business, uh, then as a transition uh, into law and the music business, working for big labels. Uh, he was involved in, uh, in the, the burgeoning Latin music scene in, in, uh, in Miami. Uh, and that's how he came to know Pitbull. And he has the distinction uh, shared with Pitbull of trademarking in law, of actually getting uh, intellectual property protection over Pitbull's trademark grito, Spanish for yell. And anyone who's listened to a Pitbull song will know what I'm talking about. And even if you haven't, this is a really fascinating uh, conversation we have about the intersection between music and law and performing, how uh, contracts are negotiated in these complex musical relationships. Uh, really great, great uh, uh, conversation with a really fascinating uh, individual. I know you will enjoy this episode of Good Law, Bad Law. Stay tuned. Uh, I want to welcome my guest today, Leslie Jose Siegel, a partner at the Miami-based law firm of Greenspoon Martyr, chair of the entertainment, media, and tech industry group at that firm. And something I didn't think I would ever say on this podcast, he is the general counsel to the recording and performing artist Pitbull. So first of all, Leslie, thank you so much for being on Good Law, Bad Law. My pleasure, my pleasure. I'm excited. Well, I feel like this is such a wonderful uh, departure from everything that we are all steeped in right now in the country in the, in the wake of the election to talk about music, to talk about uh, your career, which I'm really fascinated to hear about, and to get to the point where we explain to, to me and to our listeners how it is that a sound, Pitbull's distinctive, uh, I think we can now officially say trademarked yell or grito in Spanish, mm -hmm. how that came to be, which is how we come to uh, meet each other today. So. Um, really excited to talk with you about all of that. So to tell us a little bit about yourself, Leslie, and uh, how you came to be where you are. I know you started in the music biz. But give us a little bit of your background. Sure. So I started off, I've been, you know, my entire career has been in, in the uh, entertainment industry in some form or fashion. Uh, I did not start off as a lawyer. I started off working for a gentleman named George Ween, who is best known as the founder of the Newport Jazz Festival in 1954. Uh, he then went on to do uh, the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Festival. He did the Newport Folk Festival, where Dylan famously went electric. Yep. Uh, the Cool Jazz Festivals and a whole host of other events. Uh, he was the first promoter to start working with sponsors in 1967 with Schlitz Beer. So he was a real, a real pioneer. He's still alive. We're still in touch. Very, you know, great friend, um, and uh, you know, a, a great mentor. And I'm a huge jazz fan, so it was kind of a dream job to do that. And like most things in the business, I started off at the very bottom, fetching coffee, answering phone calls, um, but quickly worked my way up to, you know, roadie, doing catering, writing press releases, stage management, production management. Then I got char put in charge of festivals, and I was in charge of the, uh, the Miller Maquina Musical, which is the largest Hispanic outdoor concert series that I ran for a few years. Wow. I was a tour manager for Branford Marcellus for the European tour. Um, ran American Express gold card events and platinum card by invitation only. So it was, it was a great, great uh, learning experience. Did that for about seven years in, in, in New York City. Uh, and then I decided to leave New York, come to Miami and go to law school, uh, where I was hopeful to do entertainment law in the Latin business because I saw a big opportunity and I speak Spanish. My parents are from Argentina. Mm. So moved to Miami. Um, then uh, I, uh, uh, one of my early jobs was as general counsel at BMG's Latin division. Uh, which was one of the multinationals. Uh, then I became the vice president of legal and business affairs for all of Latin America for BMG. So I oversaw US Latin, you know, all the various countries, uh, did all the publishing, all the big publishing deals, big record deals involved in policy issues, you know, the invention of the DVD, uh, this thing called Napster, mm -hmm. uh, worked on digitizing the entire Latin catalog for the launch of iTunes, you know, the dot-com revolution. So, so I got, had a, a front row seat to all of that, which was really 
quite the learning experience. I don't, how is that even possible? I mean, you look way too young to have had all of that, ex, all of those experiences, which you've rattled off in about a minute and a half. Um, taking a step back, so I mean, to started at the bottom and worked your way up to to all the things you were doing in the music business. What was it about becoming a lawyer in the entertainment field that that drew you particularly? You know, it, it's it, it's funny, Aaron. I remember, uh, so I went to the University of Rochester undergrad, and at the my end of my the summer of my sophomore year, I went to the Cool Jazz Festival at the Kennedy Center. It was twelve stages, no, seven stages for twelve hours straight. I got to see all my heroes. You know, I got to see Miles Davis. You know, McCoy Tyner. Um, uh, um, you know, Benny Goodman uh, played, and I, you know, saw George Ween playing piano with with a great group. And I thought, wow, this is this is really cool. You know, this guy gets to jam, and he also gets to to run these things. And I'm a bass player, and I still still perform professionally. Um, so, so that's what got me, you know, initially interested. And I designed my major with that in mind. Um, so that was kind of the, the beginning of it. But I'm I'm spacing out. I, I don't remember exactly what your question was. I don't know well, if I answered. You were in the music business. You were, as as I now know, performing and. Oh, oh! Why, why did I want to become a lawyer? Oh, yeah. So when I was at when I was at University of Rochester, I was the business manager for the Eastman Jazz Ensemble because I knew I wanted to do festivals and stuff. And I remember in the textbook there was a line in it that said, "Entertainment attorneys are some of the most powerful people in the music business." Mm -hmm. And kind of a light bulb went off, and it kind of stored away, you know, because I was a sophomore or, or junior in, in college. And I thought, wow, that's it's an interesting position. And when I started working for George, you know, met his attorney, uh, who uh, unfortunately just passed away a few, a few weeks ago. Um, Jeff Greenberg, great guy, who's way, way too young, but, um, but, you know, met him, you know, started to see, wow, there's a real business as far as being an entertainment lawyer. Um, I also felt when I was working for George towards the end, as I was doing things for American Express and others, it was really a cool gig, but I felt like I was getting farther and farther away from the music. And I was always a big proponent of artists' rights and wanting to, to work for, for artists' benefit. Um, so that was, you know, all kind of combined of, okay, well, I could do this work, get closer to the music, be involved. There's a real career here, you know, that, that has some longevity. So kind of all those things together pushed me in that direction. I was always very interested in law. Um, when I remember working with, a, a, I would produce a lot of shows in Miami for, for Miller and, and, you know, made some very, very good friends down here who all encouraged me and said, hey, if you did entertainment law in Miami, you would do great. You speak Spanish, you understand the business. So all those things together, and I was tired of New York City. I said, okay, let, let's make the change. So that's, that's what got me to go into law, is to move down here. It sounds like a lot of people who are interested in business or being part of business and try to get there from law, through law, uh, what, what you found through, through entertainment law and all your background in the music business, it sounds like you're able to do that. You're able to be a lawyer, but really be close to what's what's become most important to you in terms of the artist rights uh, through law, which, which I think is a pretty rare accomplishment, for, you know. Yeah, we, 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 without a doubt. I mean, listen, I'm, I'm, it, 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 I think it's, it's a somewhat rarefied club. There's not that many of us, you know, you know, we, you know most of us know each other. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, listen, you, you, you find, you know, I find that a lot of my colleagues in entertainment law, like me, are huge music fans. Um, you know, you know, an interesting thing, Aaron, I used to have, you know, you know, when you're young, you, you have some of these, these sort of notions. I was, I, I, I used to kind of, um, uh, what's the word, you know, I, I, I used to demonize the record industry before I started working in the record industry, meaning the sort of stereotypical things, oh, record deals all suck, artists are taking advantage of, you know, all, all these sorts of things. What I realized getting inside of a multinational is that, all the lawyers, all the people that for the most part that work in it are huge music fans. Mm. So there's not this sort of lockstep, you know, the label is the devil trying to screw over artists. It's not that at all. There's, you know, as, as I started to understand the P&L of how a label operates, I really learned a lot about business. And you start to understand that when you're in a business that effectively um, is dependent on 5%, you know, of, of, its, uh, uh, of its product, so to speak, to drive the entire profitability of the company, that's a really hard business model. And the nature of it, you know, back in what, you know, what, what I think still was somewhat of the golden day of the record business is you sign all these artists, you may try, you may think that they're the best and they don't hit. 
and you have other artists that you'd never expect and they and and, and they hit huge and you know when you go through that there everything costs money so if you're going to do a video you're going to do a shoot you're going to you know do all these things marketing advertising etc those are all real dollars that go out and you need dollars that go in you know to, to justify that um and so as i started to to do that i started to understand a lot more how these economic models came about what was good about them what was bad about them um and what the reality was and i started to realize okay it's a business first and foremost in any business you have to make a profit every year if you're going to keep your employees because you've got a whole bevy of employees that are depending on this business, you know, for their livelihood, for their health insurance, to put food on their table. Mm -hmm. um, and the record business is no different than running a, your own law firm, which I, which I did, you know, after my BMG days as well, where you have to, you know, the income has to be greater than, than, than the expenses. So there was a real transformation in my mindset once I got in working for, for BMG. And I think, you know, and my relationship with the artist was always great. You know, I was always, I took a very straightforward approach. I remember many artists, you know, would come and ask me questions. Well, you know, what's this container deduction? I'd say, well, listen, this is just another way to screw you and lower how much we're going to pay you. <laughs> I, I, it, I, I was very, I was very transparent about it because I wasn't here to go and sell, you know, some people and, and everyone has their own style, but some people have the style of wanting to sell. Oh, it's all okay. I want to be very straight with someone and, also, what I would say to them is, listen, you have a decision to make. Nobody's holding a gun to your head to sign with us. You know, you can go and do this on your own. Yeah. Do you hire a promotion team in Colombia, in Peru, in Argentina, in Mexico? Because that's what you have to do. So, you know, some people think of freedom. And I remember having a, a conversation with a client. We were looking to renew a, a major label deal. And the client said, well, why don't I just do this on my own? I, you know, then I'm going to be free. I said, oh, let me ask you a question. If you have to hire staff in Germany, to promote there you have to hire staff in france if you have all this other overhead is that freedom he's like well that's not freedom i said well you're independent you're quote unquote free but freedom comes with expenses sure. and so some people have this romanticized notion of what freedom is but you know you know uh, has, has, freedom is just another word for nothing left to lose you know <laughs> <laughs> absolutely um all right so Let's talk about Pitbull, and this is fascinating to me because I did read your bio, and I know that uh, your parents were doctors and were opera lovers, and so you grew up in a home listening to opera, as I did, uh, and and grew up in the era of classic rock, what we now call classic rock. I think of it as just the the '60s and the '70s, um, and uh, well, well, let me. Let, there's a caveat to that, which is not in my bio. So my parents were you know, opera and classical music fans. I had an older brother and sister uh, who were very, who were 10 and eight years older than me. So they were right in the thick of it. My brother saw Hendrix, he saw The Doors. He didn't go to Woodstock because my parents didn't let him. Um, <laughs> you know, they saw their first Dead shows in like 1970. So I, you know, they bought two albums a week. And so I was exposed to everything from Frank Zappa to uh, The Grateful Dead, to the Allman Brothers Band, to Brewer and Shipley, to, you know, just, uh, all of the classic Janis Joplin, Jimi Hendrix, Led Zeppelin. As a as a six, seven, eight year old, I used to hang out in the room a lot, you know, with their friends, and it was always very smoky in the room. You know, <laughs> they smoke cigarettes, um, <laughs> but yeah, that was part of my 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 growing up as well. Right. Okay. So that, but and and I can see how your career took you in the direction of Latin music, um, but but let's get specific because I I do want to get to this really. Uh, fascinating accomplishment with, with respect to Pitbull. How, how did you and he meet? And, and tell us, for, for those who don't know, I can't imagine there is anyone who doesn't know, but, but tell us who he is and how you came to sure. meet, kind of what his place is in the Miami music scene and beyond. So, so uh, I left BMG in 2003. I went to a big firm, uh, to Greenberg Chart for about three years. And then in 2006, I opened up my own firm. Got very entrepreneurial. I actually got involved. I produced a couple of films. Um, in fact, one of them is back there with uh, with Meryl. It was a, 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 a documentary that we did with, with Meryl Streep um, and was involved in certain tech companies. Uh, you know, went through the 2008, uh, you know, uh, 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 bubble crash, uh, which was uh, quite the learning experience. But in 2010, I got hired by Dr. Pepper and their ad agency to do the first corporate sponsorship deal for the artist Pitbull, who is a Miami rapper, well-known, he's Cuban. He raps in English and Spanish and Spanglish. Uh, he was 
to Latin for you know black hip hop to uh, urban for Latin music. So he was really uh, you know he was you know blue eyed. He, you know didn't fit into any box that you could neatly check stuff off. And he refused to um, uh, to deviate artistically to sing 100 percent in in English. Every one of his songs he's got some Spanish in some form or, 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 or fashion. And so he was he was on the rise. Um, and then uh, in 2010, uh, uh, I got approached by Dr. Pepper and their ad agency. Quick little sidebar there. The person at the ad agency who recommended me was the son of my boss at BMG. Uh -huh. And when he was in college, I helped get him an internship at MTV. And then he kind of came back. Just a quick thing to say, any would-be lawyers that want to be out there and, and people in the business, et, et cetera. You know, the, the adage is not what you know, it's who you know. I say it's, it's partially true. Who you know can get you in the door, but then you have to walk through it and you have to deliver the goods. So you have to be good at what you do, but relationships are incredibly important. And I'm still very, very close friends with them to this day. But anyway, he introduced me to Dr. Pepper and their ad agency. I got hired. We did the deal. Um, after the deal closed, uh, I remember uh, we did the video shoot for the t television commercial and I was hanging out in, uh, in Pitt, uh, Armando is his name, in his dressing room with the other musicians and stuff. And having been on the road, being a musician, I'm very comfortable in that environment. Mm -hmm. And I kind of find out, you know, I get a call from his manager that weekend and he says, hey, Leslie, you know, Pitt wants to meet with you. And I'm like, okay, about what? And because um, I, you know, I knew his lawyer who actually had been my intern. I was not at all trying to poach him or anything. And I was like, wow, well, he's, he's thinking of, of, of making some changes. I said, fine, I'll, I'll sit down. So we meet the next week and uh, he said he really enjoyed working with me. Uh, and asked if I would switch sides. And I said, sure. And that was about 12 years ago, 11, 12 years ago. And I've been with him ever since. And so what is what are the range of things that that involves? I mean, being his general counsel, his, which for those who don't know that term, I mean, that would be his lead lawyer, sort of in-house in, within his business. Uh, yeah. what, is that, what does that encompass? I, I prefer the Italian word consigliere. <laughs> Yeah, and, and, and in my mind, what that means is, is to me, the ideal relation, the, the ideal sort of client relationship is when, as, as, as an attorney, is when your client comes to you for every major decision in their lives. Um, if you have that sort of a, a establishment where you're really their trusted advisor and, and they trust your, your voice, you know, you've, you've made it. That, that to me, that's, that's what I always strive for with, with, with all of my clients. Um, but in his case, you know, he is, you know, he uh, is, is such a unique um, artist um, and, and business person. So, you know, the, the first thing that, that I learned from him is he really understood the importance of ubiquity. What do I mean by that? So from my days in the label, I knew that whenever you had a feature, when, you know, an artist wanted to have someone else feature on or they wanted to be featured on the other one, you know, at the label, the mentality was, okay, well, if we're going to give this feature to Universal, they have to give us one of their artists before we'll do something else. That's the way that the labels think. Mm -hmm. So it's a very tit for tat sort of thing um, and, and very structured and you don't want to have too many people because it's going to dilute you. He threw that playbook out. In his mind, and this was when he started off, he would walk into studios, he would just jump on people's records. And he really didn't care, you know, hey, do I get paid for it? You know, in the early stage, do I get paid or not get paid? You know, he just thought it was important to be out there and to work on his craft. Relationships, you said relationships. So, you know, the first album I had to clear for him was unique because he came to me and we had 12 tracks and we had over a dozen features on each track. So we had scenarios where we had multiple authors on the compositional side, as much, many as 12, 12 writers on one song. We had one, two, three features, one or two producers, um, samples on some tracks. So I had this massive information that I had to clear and get a handle on. So it was very good because it taught me to create, you know, I have this kind of, you know, database system that, that I've created for clearing records where basically, you know, I, you know, each song is its own like little story and I'm able to have all the information on one sheet and I tie that in a database format into a summary. So I can know, for instance, the song splits and given, you know, he or any other artist has to deliver call it, you know, three songs per album, I would know, okay, we're 2.91 and we're done. You need to, we need to figure out how we're going to negotiate to make sure you have enough, so enough songs. That's something that I 
created that database to have at a touch of a button exactly know where, where I was with that. So that was one of the lessons from that. And then creating forms. And then again, relationships. I, I'll give you a, a, a perfect example. There was, when I first started working with them, there was an issue um, having to do with one producer from a prior album that hadn't gotten cleared. All I heard, you know, I was just told, ah, the lawyer on the other side is, you know, is difficult, whatever, whatever. So I called what, the lawyer. What does that mean, cleared? Because that, that, I think I know what that means, but for people. Sure. So, so, so what happens? So from a copyright standpoint, there's two copyrights that are on a, a recording. You have what's known as the, uh, the copyright in the composition, also known as music publishing, which could or could not be, it may or may not be from that particular artist. Mm -hmm. So you look at Whitney Houston, she wrote nothing. So she didn't have any publishing, right? But there were other songwriters that were on it, you know, Jimmy Jam, Terry Lewis, others uh, who would have the publishing. So you have to uh, understand the percentage of each contributor, get them to sign off on what's known as a split sheet where they all ascertain, okay, I own 13% of this, you own 27%, you know, you own this amount, et cetera, to cut, get up to 100%. Um, and then on the recording side of things, if you have a sample, you have to clear the sample, meaning you have to get the rights and the other master recording to be interpolated into your, into your song into your into your version of that recording. You pay for that, right? I mean, you would give some percentage. You, you, for... you give some some percentage of, of, of the of the of, of the royalty stream for that. Okay. Similarly speaking, a producer gets a percentage of the royalty stream uh, of the recording because they produced it, and they typically will get some publishing as well because they're typically writers, um, but not always. So there was a producer that there was a holdup that they hadn't cleared something up. So I called the lawyer up. Um, and I knew his, his boss uh, from his firm said, hey, how are you doing? You know, unless they, you know, his name was, let's just call it Jonathan. I said, hey, Jonathan, um, I understand there's an issue. Tell me what's going on. So, um, uh, and, and again, from a relationship standpoint, I did not go in assuming that he was a bad actor or nefarious or doing something wrong. I simply just asked the question to ascertain for myself to understand what the issue is because our job is to negotiate and you know, figure out problems. So I said, uh, you know, what's going on? And he explained to me that in the, because when you do a deal with a producer who gets a percentage of the recording income, they want to see the royalty provision in the recording agreement that shows how they're going to get paid. So to give you an example for, for, for the math here. So if an artist has a 15% royalty, the producer gets 3% of that 15%. Three over 15 equals 20%, which means on flat fee income that comes in, Instead of 3%, they'll get 20% because it's on the basis of that 100% pie. Mm -hmm. okay. So he explained to me that the royalty exhibit we gave doesn't say how much my artist is, is, is getting, call it 15% for easy math to his 3%. So I don't know how much we're going to get paid. I said, and I looked at the contract, and this was kind of a unique contract to joint venture. So it, didn't, it, didn't, it actually didn't have it in there. He was correct. So... I said, let me investigate. So I called up the royalty department at, at, uh, at the label and I said, hey, you know, we have this question, you know, how does this work? And they said, oh, for these types of deals, we have an imputed royalty of, call it 15%, just to continue with, with, with the example. Um, and I said, oh, could you hold on a second? And they said, sure. So I passed Jonathan. I said, Jonathan, I'm speaking to the RCA royalty department in Lyndhurst, New Jersey. Could I patch you into the call? He's like, sure. So I introduced him. I said, listen, this is the you know, the, the, uh, the lawyer for the producer, he's got this question. Can you explain, you know, how, how, uh, how this works? And I said, oh yeah, we have an imputed royalty of 15%. Producer's going to get, if it's 3%, they'll get 20% of that. Amount. Okay, thank you very much. Hung up. And then Jonathan stays line and said, so Jonathan, you know, you're absolutely correct. We don't have this in the exhibit. I want to get this closed. I can assure you I'm going to talk to the label. I'm going to get a revised royalty exhibit, but can we close on this basis? And he said, listen, Typically speaking, I would not do this without something in writing. But, you know, I know of your reputation and you just put me on with the royalty department, so I'll go with it, but please get that fixed. Okay, so we do that. So then, relationships. Three weeks later, I get a call from Pitt. He said, Leslie, I've got this great new record. I need it cleared right away. I said, okay, great. Tell me about it. He said, it's called Give Me Everything, and it's got Afrojack and it's got Neo as a feature. Who's Neo's lawyer? Jonathan. I called Jonathan back three weeks later. Hey, how you doing? Hey, we're going to work together again. We got this thing. Oh, okay. So I negotiated that deal in 13 minutes. Mm. That was Pitt's biggest hit. Number one in 17 countries. Wow. Incredible. Um, okay. So 
so this idea of we've used the term copyright and clearing, which imply which which implicates permissions and and revenue streams to all the varying people that have an interest in a, in a record in a recording. Um, but then we get to then we get to the idea of trademarking something, and I think most people who aren't lawyers in this area who think of trademark think of a symbol like the the Nike swoosh, yes. or or a logo that you know of a company uh, in words that that can be trademarked. Um, I don't know. <laughs> what would be a good example of a, of, a, of a logo? Um, or the McDonald's uh, Golden Arch. The McDonald's Golden Arch is perfect. Yes. So, uh, but the idea for a musical artist to trademark a sound, which after all, they're making music, so which consists of sounds, um, that seems pretty unusual uh, to, to conceive of, let alone accomplish through the legal process that you have to go through to get that type of property ownership, which is in effect what it is. You own something when you have it trademarked or copyrighted. You actually own right. it. So how did, tell us how that idea came about. And, and then I just want to, you know, in lay terms, really understand what it means to Pitbull and what this might mean to other artists, because this is going to set an example for sure. So let me give you some background on this. So there was a recording that came out pretty well-known recording, and uh, Pitt's signature uh, sensory mark is ee which he does right before he goes into rapping on a song. He's been doing that easily 20 years. I mean, from the beginning of his, of his career. We have, going back to the early 2000s. So there's another artist that did a song. It had that on it, and then um, Pitt wasn't on it. And he started getting calls from friends. Hey, I thought you were on this record. I heard of you. So, so um, you know, then, you know, because he's got a great sense of humor and, 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 and does these things, didn't call me first, he goes and puts out a remix and of that song, grabs the master, does a remix, jumps on it, and basically says, hey, I wasn't on the original, I might as well be on the remix. <laughs> so that is good. the label of that track didn't see the humor or irony in that and immediately sent the cease and desist and it got taken down off of whatever internet site. It's his sound! <laughs> so I engaged in discussions with the label, whatever. We ended up coming to a, to a resolution on, on this where they've acknowledged the trademark. It took a while, but we got there. But so we're going through this, we started to think about it. So myself and the team, you know, were talking about it. And, you know, we kind of collectively came up with this idea of, well, we could, you know, you think of Tarzan's yell. You think of the MGM lion's roar. Mm. You think of the NBC chimes. Those are all sounds. Those all have sensory marks. Mm -hmm. There's really not that many sensory marks out there. It's, so it's a couple of dozen. So of the millions of trademarks that are out there, it's a very, very, very small uh, club that, that has that. So we embarked on a process with the U.S. Trademark Office. My partner, Justin McNaughton, handled all, all, the, all the filings. Um, and we you know, went and did this. And uh, after about two years, two and a half years, it was granted. Mm. So it was a very, you know, we were very, you know, uh, celebrated with that. And, and then uh, myself and Justin and then uh, uh, Ryan Carrillo, who's another attorney um, uh, uh, on the team, got involved. And we wrote this law review article that was published in the NYU uh, Law Review, which is great. I haven't published a law review article since law school when I, when I did one then. And Pitbull, uh, Pitbull also was a signer on the, on the and, well, and, right? and he, and he, yeah, and he, he, and he was uh, on it as well because we talked about it and, and, you know, he went through the article. It's not that long an article. And, and, and we talked about it. a lot of the concepts are his and so forth. And it's like, you should be an author of this. He said, okay. So it's just like, you know, walking into a studio and getting a couple of points and we do our split sheet. So it's the same sort of concept. So I, of course, had no problem whatsoever in, in sharing, a, a, you know, a, 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 a credit with, with, with Armando on, on that. So to do that, to, so, so to understand what that means to have that sound, that grito or that yell, uh, trademarked, mm -hmm. um, you had to establish that that sound was uniquely identified with him and that he was uniquely Correct. identified with that sound. Correct. And, and we did that by virtue of the fact that he has so many global hits. Um, it's on there. Uh, there was an article that was written 
um, I forgot which publication talking about, you know, the history of the Grito and so forth and, and, and the importance of it. Um, and by virtue of all of those things, we were able to give to the trademark examiner enough for her or him to say, okay, this is, this is something that's unique. We're going to, we're going to grant the trademark to it. All right, so so he if so now he has an intellectual property interest in that sound, meaning that's correct. If we go back to the what the situation that led to this idea in the first place, if this other artist were to try to uh, create a recording using that sound, obviously borrowing it or or imitating it or outright copying it. Uh, Pitbull would have a right to seek compensation for that, right? To, to, today, um, because, you know, trademark is, is, in addition to use, you have to have a registration to prosecute the claim. So um, this came about after that recording, we ended up getting, you know, having a retroactive trademark license. So again, there's, there's zero issues, legal issues there. But going forward, so for instance, you know, he recently did a commercial for Boost uh, that if you want to, you know, uh, uh, see it on YouTube uh, where he's in a race car and you hear the trademark. And part of my, you know, without getting into uh, any confidential details, I mean, they licensed that mar that that sound for the for the television commercial. So it is operating in commerce now. Okay, so uh, just a couple of questions about what this means then to the to the business. Uh, you mentioned earlier the idea of sampling, and this has been a feature of rap and 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 pop pop music generally for for a lot of years now. I was listening to some Pitbull songs just to do a little homework and prepare for our conversation, and I was listening to Fireball, which is which is another you know big hit of his, and uh, he uses the phrase "walk this way" a couple of times in the song. Now I am a, I am a, I grew up in the '70s again, and I remember very well Aerosmith's song "Walk This Way." Is yeah. that an allusion to that? Is that well? He's he's, he's, actually, of that he's actually he's a big Aerosmith fan. Yeah, uh, he's uh, you know Joe Perry has played on uh, has performed with him. Um, I think he's done some stuff with Steve Tyler. Um, you know he's a he's a very you know well versed you know music fan. Um, I don't recall particularly on that, uh, um, the, if, if I recall correctly, because we go through, you know, uh, you know with, with the label, uh, you know, with the major label, we go through a very arduous process and have people who are sample experts listen to it. Mm. You know, so anything that's there, that if they think it's a sample, we go, we investigate, is it a sample, does it pass the test? And, and it's a very sort of, it's, it's maybe more art than science, but, you know, if you, th I don't believe on that one that that was that that was really a sample because you know the words "walk this way" don't get you there. They're not protected. It's it's the way in which you sing them, and I don't believe he sings them the same way that uh, uh, that Steve Tyler sings them. Yeah, well, and there, I mean, it's also because there are intentional borrowing of musical phrases or sound. Sure, for sure. Yeah. All that, that happens. All, all that happens with him quite frequently, and we license all those. Mm -hmm. We, and then there's we, unintentional ones, which I guess is why you said you have people listening to see is that there might be something uh, subconscious. I mean, there was a big litigation that Led Zeppelin finally won over, over the song Stairway to Heaven, where it was alleged they had stolen, if you want right. to take the view of the, of the other artist who was making the allegations, or, or it was subconscious or unintentional. Um, there was yeah. that song blurred lines, which ulti ultimately right. uh, ended up in litigation as well. I mean, th this does yeah, come uh, up. My, my, there's the um, uh, My Sweet Lord, George Harrison. Right. He's, uh, he's so fine. That, that's a big case. So um, what does it mean then going forward? Do you think this is something other artists could try to do with it? it because it's obviously good for an artist's brand, for sure. I mean, yeah. Look, you were able to do with this licensing deal. So, you know, it, it's, it, you know, I, I, I can't, I, I don't want to speak for others, but, you know, to the extent that someone has, I mean, you know, I, I, I'm very, you know, very fortunate to, to work with, with Armando. You know, he is one of those artists where he starts singing and you know, it's him right away. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, very few artists that, that have that sort of signature sound where you absolutely know it, it's them, you know, mm -hmm. and he joins, you know, that, that, that rare group. 
Um, and so he, you know, he has certain, you know, phrases and so forth that, that he's able to use. To the extent there's another artist that has that on every single song, I don't know that there are that many that, that, that it's so prevalent. Yeah. It's just one of his devices. I mean, and, and it's very funny as you, as you look, as we, you know, we're, we're researching this, you know, you look through the evidence, there's all these sorts of memes on, on, on the internet, how to write a Pitbull song, you know? Mm-hmm. You gotta say Dale, you gotta say EU, you know? And those were all things that were there before we even started filing the, the trademark. So that was very useful in the process of this because he's known, you know, in, in that way. Well, and you've negotiated, you know, so many deals over the years. You wouldn't want it to be too easy to get legal protection over a sound or a phrase or a signature yeah. or that, right? Because otherwise it would be a minefield trying, right. you know, trying to navigate in and around all these protected words, phrases, and sounds. Well, yeah, and, and I think that the Blurred Lines case especially, um, I, I didn't think so at the beginning, but after, you know, reading and, and talking to some other, some other the colleagues on it, you know, I, I don't think that that was correctly decided. And I think that that's a bit of a dangerous precedent. Um, I'm, you know, I'll tell you, I'm a huge Marvin Gaye fan. Um, when I first heard it, I was like, it, it reminded me of it. it. Definitely reminded me the, the groove, the feel. But as you start to dig in, it's not a, a, a copy. And the thing about copyright laws is very, very specific. You know, it's not about a feel. It's not about a groove. You know, it's about actually you know, right. the notes, the, the, the beats, et cetera. And is it, is it in that, in that vibe? Sure. You know, is it the same? No. I mean, I, I play, uh, you know, uh, I've played the uh, bass in a Grateful Dead uh, band for a couple of years. I did a couple of years ago and, you know, and there's definitely a sound when you go do the jams and all that stuff, you know, but it, it, again, there's, there's a difference between that, um, you know, and, and you think about, you know, for jazz, uh, you know, mm-hmm. from an improvisational standpoint, you know, you'll hear Charlie Parker on a solo all of a sudden quote a tisket a tasket. So does that mean that that's a sample? There's some argument to me that's more, that's closer to it than, than a blurred line. Yeah. But who knows? Well, and I mean, I'm a another, mus- another podcast. I wouldn't, I wouldn't really call myself a musician, but I do play guitar. And I remember at one point seeing a video <clears throat> by some musician who took the uh, C, A minor, D chord progression and showed you how many songs use yes. the same three chords. There, there's, that, there's that video, no, it's, it's actually four, four chords. It's like all these songs in four chords and it's like a 50 songs, 50 pop songs. They all sound really different, but also at the same time very similar because they're using the same chords. Yeah, exactly. So we're, you know, that's really the blurred line of that whole issue. Think, 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 think of the blues. Yeah. One, four, five. Every single blues is exactly the same progression. So. Absolutely. Well, this is so great. And I love talking about music and if we can fit law into it as well, even better. Uh, uh, Leslie, thank you so much. This was great. I really enjoyed your time and uh, for being on Good Law, Bad Law. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. Did did you, uh, because I remember on the email, did you want to talk about COVID at all in the business? Talk about COVID in the business? Sure. What? what, 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 I've been doing a lot of different interviews. So, you know, let me, if I can just com- comment for a minute, because uh, this yeah. is, I think, you know, I, I've been really, really delving into this area very, very extensively. So, you know, coming from festivals, it's kind of in my DNA. I still love to go to festivals and so forth. You know, my, my kids love to go to concerts. Um, you know, we're at, at, a, at a very, very critical juncture right now, because if you think about it, basically the entire live music industry shut down for this year. And for next year, with the spikes and the lack of response, you know, that the, the federal government is taking, I don't know that it's going to open up anytime soon. Right. But, you know, it's, it's a very, very critical issue right now um, for a lot of industries. So it's definitely, you know, a concern. I'm looking into this, you know, quite a bit, talking to a lot of folks about protocols, things, things that can be done. But I think it's going to be something, you know, especially for music lawyers to be on, on, on the lookout for. And, and I think you know, the entertainment law bar is going to take a lot of hits next year as well for those that depend on, uh, on, on music because most of the revenue from our clients comes from live performance. Yeah. And, you know, come February, early March, it'll be a year that there's been no live performances and it's, you know, we're a ways away. So just so something for, for people to, to be mindful of and, and the importance to keep your mind open, to pivot, be looking at doing different things um, because it's, there's going to be some challenging, challenging times ahead. Yeah, I, I mean that could be that could be a whole conversation unto itself, I'm sure, and um, it's just one of the many things that uh, 
many of us are really missing about this time that we're in. Uh, sure, for and, sure. And huge impact on the artists as well, I, I have to imagine. So yeah, well, I'm glad you pointed that out. And uh, so everyone get over it and wear your mask already. So we <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, maybe with uh, the change in uh, the White House, you know, we can, and hopefully some good news on vaccines, which does seem like we've had some good yeah, news. Yeah, but, but here, here's a, you know, I, I was actually just talking to a scientist today at, at a major lab to understand this better. The vaccine, what, what I think people need to understand is if you think of the flu vaccine, the flu vaccine is only effective if you take it every year. What does that mean? It means that it's not permanent. It means just because you have the vaccine, it doesn't mean that you can't get it down the road. Just like if you've had it and you've built antibodies, it doesn't mean that those last forever because they don't. So there's going to be, you know, in addition to, you know, having to get the vaccine annually, and there's going to be mutations of this virus, which is a very unique virus and acting in ways that people that, you know, researchers are, are, are not accustomed to, um, you know, you're still going to have to be vigilant and there's going to have to be testing. And my prediction is that just like we now walk through metal detectors after the Ariana Grande bombing and, and the Paris shooting, you know, at, at concerts, mm -hmm. um, it's going to be metal detectors and it's going to be testing. Eventually, I think we're going to get to the point where they'll have like a breathalyzer test where you're going to have to walk in and either show on your iPhone that you've got gotten a test um, or you've had the vaccine. Um, but I think that's where we're going because this has really pointed out uh, the susceptibility to bioterrorism for, for this country and for the mm -hmm. world for that matter. Well, and then you throw in, you know, conspiracy theorists who don't believe in vaccines and, you know, they're, it's not going to, it's not going to go away entirely. Some people are going to keep getting sick and some people are going to die from it. And there, there's a lot of people that don't trust the vaccine. They don't trust the, the, the political atmosphere around it. There's, there's yeah. a, a lot going on. It's going to be a very, very challenging time. So. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, Aaron, real this is, this is fun. Thanks for reaching out. Really great to meet you as well. Thanks so much, Leslie. Look, look forward to meeting in person and grabbing a beer. That'd be great. Okay, be well. Take care. Yeah. Bye bye.